Good evening, and welcome to tonight's conversation on complex issues, pride, 1950s people had parties. The School of the Arts is offering tonight's discussion as part of its spring 2022 public programs and engagement series on the theme of repair, which the school has described as conversations, theatrical presentations, podcasts, and performances, all aimed at exploring creative practices that engage social and political initiatives committed to reimagining and transforming frayed relationships between humans, other species, the planet, and themselves. As the NAS Professor of Law and the Director of the Studio for Law and Culture here at Columbia, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this conversation. I want to begin by acknowledging the fact that the School of the Arts, like the Columbia campus as a whole, is located on land that was part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lenni, Lenape, and Wappinger people. In acknowledging legacies of displacement, migration, and settlement, we are taking a small first step toward the long and overdue process of healing and repair. The Columbia University School of the Arts is committed to continuing to confront and address the issues of exclusion, erasure, and systematic discrimination through ongoing education and a commitment to equitable representation. As I said earlier, this lecture uh, is being co-presented tonight by the Studio for Law and Culture, the Columbia University School of the Arts, the Department of History, and I'd like to extend a special word of thanks to our colleague and friend, Carol Becker, who is the Dean uh, of the Columbia University School of Arts. You can find out more about the ongoing complex issues, series of conversations, and the recent work of the faculty of Columbia University were part of the complex issues series by going to the School of the Arts website at arts.columbia.edu. The conversation tonight is centered on the first episode of Pride, a six-part documentary series that is devoted to chronicling the fight for LGBTQ plus rights in the United States from the 1950s to the 2000s. Each episode is dedicated to one decade and is directed by a different director. Tom Kalin's contribution, the 1950s people had parties, is, and I'm reading a quotation here, a revealing look at the vibrant and full lives lived by queer people in the 1950s amidst a steep rise in governmental regulations against the LGBTQ plus community led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, who ushered in an era of government sanctioned persecution. That's a statement on the FX networks. Although in our discussion, we will be enlarging our frame beyond Senator Joseph McCarthy to look at other central figures in the transformation of what we think of as LGBTQ life during the 1950s. We have an incredible collection of participants who will be part of the panel tonight, beginning with Tom Kalin, who is Professor of Professional Practice in the MFA Film Program at Columbia in the School of the Arts. Tom's projects include the film Swoon, Savage Grace, this episode of Pride, and many other works which are recognized as 
central contributions to our understanding uh, of American life and culture. We'll be joined as well by Alex Stapleton, who is an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker for film and television. Alex's projects include Hello Privilege, It's Me, Chelsea, Pride, and God Save Texas, among many others. Our third interlocutor is Professor George Chauncey, who is the DeWitt Clinton Professor of American History at Columbia University. George's works, which are well known, include Gay New York, Gender, Urban Culture, and the Making of the Gay Male World, 1890 to 1940, and Why Marriage, the History Shaping Today's Debate over Gay Equality, among many others. You can find fuller biographies in the chat. I wanna say a little bit before we go on about the format of the webinar. We will first be hearing from Alex speaking from a perspective of a producer about the making of Pride. We'll then hear from Tom about his work on 1950s People Had Parties. After Tom speaks, we'll open up the conversation to uh, include George and engage in um, back and forth um, with Alex and Tom about the episode, about the series, and about the history and context uh, that it recounts. We'll conclude with a few minutes of audience Q&A. If you're interested in asking a question, please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the webinar page. I'd now like to turn the discussion over to Alex Stapleton. Alex? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, and thank you for putting together, uh, putting together this amazing event. Um, I'm so thrilled to be talking about pride. Um, I'm going to make my comments short because I want to really dig into the uh, amazing and beautiful episode that Tom uh, directed. Um, I will tell you that this series was a historical undertaking. And we started working on it way back in 2018 in development. Um, there was an incredible community of filmmakers that came together to make this show. And um, it will always be in my heart as a very special uh, moment in my life and my career because making this series bonded us together. Every single person on who, who, who came together from the edit phase to in the field shooting um, and every filmmaker, it, it bonded us together in a special way as, as we uh, hit the year 2020. Um, and, uh, live through a pandemic and watch the country um, go through uh, social unrest. Um, and many of us took to the streets to, to protest ourselves at what we um, watched happen and, and unfold in 2020. Um, so this is a deeply personal project to every single person that was involved. And on that note, I want to quickly um, just acknowledge the filmmakers that are, are not here today that contributed contributed to the other five episodes. Um, the 2000s directed by Roe Haver, the 1990s directed by Yancey Ford, the 1980s directed by Anthony Corona and Alex Smith, the 1970s directed by Cheryl Dunn, the 1960s directed by Andrew Ahn, and of course I was so honored to work alongside and with and for Tom Kalin, who directed the 1950s, uh, the very the first episode of our series. And on that note, I'm, I'm handing the, the baton to, to Tom. Hey, Alex, it's so nice to be at least virtually with you during this crazy time where so few of us get to be together. Um, and it's nice to be with all of you here tonight. And I want to acknowledge um, a few of the collaborators for this episode are actually here with us. One of them is the episode editor, John Lyons. Hi, John. Um, and the, another is the an, uh, executive producer of the whole series, Stacey Scripter, um, as well as other friends who have joined. And it's just nice to see you all here and um, feels comfortable and fun to share this with you. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge, of course, the amazing Christine Bashan and Killer Films and Refinery29, who are the two entities who initiated this project. Um, I first heard about Pride, I guess, in 2018, um, when Christine Bashan and I had a meal together and talked about something she was working on with a producer who was then at Refinery29. Um, her name was Erica Chenoweth. Um, and they had envisioned this series called Pride and imagined breaking it, uh, starting in the 1950s and moving to present day and breaking the, you know, that period of time, time into a series of decades. Um, there was what's called a deck and a sizzle reel that existed at that stage, um, which is basically a visual document showing you what might possibly be in each episode and possible narratives that might be covered along with picture research. And then the sizzle reel was, you know, video clips. Um, from all of the all of the decades um, and sort of highlights and moments from those historical period. I was lucky because I was able to talk to the producers and then eventually FX, the network, early and make a pitch for the episode that I wanted to do, which my, my first choice was to do the 1950s and I was lucky enough to get to do it. Um, I had not really, I mostly worked as a filmmaker dealing with period um, and especially looking at um, issues of sexuality or sexual identity or class um, and how they've been impacted by various historical periods. I was really interested in the 50s, 60s and 70s and was sort of ambivalent about which one to go for. I ended up going for the 50s. When they accepted my pitch, I remember having a moment of sort of panic um, and thinking that maybe that I should have you know, gone for the 60s or gone for the 70s, but in the end I was thrilled that I did what I did. Um, I'm gonna share screen now and just walk you through a document that I produced. So I didn't know Alex Stapleton before I did this project. She came into the project through Killer Films and Refinery29 to be the showrunner basically, to be the producer, the overall producer of the series working with Christine um, and uh, another producer um, from Killer Films to look at kind of the overall vision and assemble the creative team and support us and help us figure out how to make those episodes happen. Um, so, boom. Okay, so uh, this is the, that logo comes from the deck that was produced by Killer Films and Refinery29. And this is a document that I produced to share with everybody who worked on my episode from the cinematographer and production designer, the creative team to the interview subjects um, who include, if you've seen the episode, episode, George Chauncey, who's with us here today uh, and will come in um, a little bit later in the conversation. I tried to focus on four characters and successfully really focused on three. The first is Madeline Tress. Madeline Tress graduated from Georgetown University and worked for the Department of Commerce in the 1950s. She had to pass a security investigation for her employment. And during the process of that investigation, she discovered that there was an FBI file and that she had been being surveyed since her teenage years, actually, when she went to a May Day march, um, you know, and was suspected or, you know, had sort of very mild interest in the Communist Party as a teenager. And this amounted to surveillance that caused her to lose her government job, uh, move to San Francisco and start a second life there as a lawyer. Um, She's played in the episode by Alia Shawkat, and I interview her brother, Arthur Tress, who's a photographer. You can see how much the real, this is her government ID on the left. You can see how much she looks like the real, um, that Alia Shawkat looks like the real Madeline Tress. And I want to give props to um, Alex Stapleton, whose brilliant idea it was to cast Alia. She was the one when we were thinking about who could play her that just sort of popped out of her mouth, and it was exactly the right suggestion. Again, um, photographs of the real Madeline Tress in her daily life. Her case sort of captures what might be called the Lavender Scare, which was a period of time in the 1950s when the US government made it impossible to be homosexual and a government employee. Um, what you're seeing here is the representation of a bill proposed to the 116th Congress, which was in 2019, 2020, it was called the Lavender Offense Victim Exoneration Act. And it was attempting to sort of bring attention to the lives that, and careers that had been destroyed by this moment in American history, the Lavender Scare. Um, it was amazing to interview Arthur Tress, who's a well-known art photographer um, and who was Madeline's younger brother and sort of understand something about what it was like to grow up gay in the 1950s. 
The second major narrative was a story I was shocked, and I think most of us as Americans should be shocked that we don't know about. I bet most of you don't know this case, or didn't maybe before you saw the episode, which is the former governor of New Hampshire, I mean, of Wyoming, sorry, um, and, the, and senator of Wyoming, um, Senator Lester Hunt, who in 1954 shot himself in the senator, uh, Senate office, which is an extremely rare um, occurrence. Um, and this happened because he was being blackmailed by Republican Senator Style Bridges um, and, and Herman Welker, who were in cahoots with Joseph McCarthy. Basically, Senator Hunt's son, Buddy Hunt, um, had solicited an undercover police officer in Lafayette Square Park, which is directly across from the White House and in the 1950s was a notorious gay cruising area. And when his, you know, these Republican senators used this arrest as an attempt to um, blackmail the senator and it led to his suicide. Um, in 2015, Senator Tammy Baldwin appealed to the attorney general trying to reopen the case, but it didn't succeed. She was one of the people um, that I interviewed in the episode. Uh, you see here um, Senator Lester Hunt as a senator uh, in his daily job. You see the sad sight of his funeral. Um, that happened in 1954. The story of Lester Hunt was uh, fictionalized in a novel that won the Pulitzer Prize called Advise and Consent, and was also then made into a Hollywood film directed by Otto Preminger, um, famous for a bunch of things, but among them that it was the first appearance of a gay bar in a Hollywood film. The film was made in the early 60s. The problem with both novel and film is they obscured the case. They made it less visible, less known. Um, this is Lester Hunt, the son of uh, Lester Hunt Jr. This is the son of the Senator Lester Hunt. He was known as Buddy Hunt. He was a seminary student arrested, as I said, uh, for soliciting an undercover uh, police officer. Um, and it mentions in this text that he was, you know, uh, this case was fictionalized in the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Devising Consent. You see his, high, uh, his college yearbook, you see a picture of Buddy with his parents. You see the um, you know, newspaper headline of him being arrested for a morals charge. On the lower left, you actually see his daughter. Um, Buddy went on to marry and have uh, two children. I interview his daughter, Ellen, in the episode. You see a snapshot of her on the lower left from 1963 when she's a child. We're very close in age. And then finally, I focused on Christine Jorgensen, who um, you know, was uh, fought in World War II, was drafted in the US Army uh, after graduating from high school in the Bronx um, and had a sexual reassignment surgery in Denmark, was widely thought to be the first trans person in America, um, but that's not actually true. There were many trans Americans before Christine Jorgensen, um, but she brought great uh, attention and celebrity even to uh, the transition she made um, from being assigned male at birth to becoming female. I um, mean, you can see some of the newspaper clippings and images of her. Um, what I didn't know when I uh, focused on her case was that she was actually a filmmaker and photographer. Um, and that uh, one of the great joys of this process was discovering through Susan Stryker, who's one of the interview subjects about um, Christine Jorgensen, this incredible trove of super eight and 16 millimeter footage that Christine Jorgensen made. And then quickly to kind of wrap up, there were two characters, you know, that was enough, um, those three characters to fit in a 45 minute um, episode of whatever my episode is, 47 minutes, John would know. Um, so there were other characters. One is this man named JJ Bellinger, you see on the right. I discovered him or knew about him because of these photo booth images of him kissing this person named Robert Block, who you see on the left. Um, and they were so striking and so intimate, a picture of everyday life. Two people had gone into the privacy of a photo booth to kiss and record that moment. And um, I was really moved and touched, I think, by a lot of people by the sight of that photograph. Um, and learning more about him, uh, I discovered that he had actually fought in World War II and had fought alongside his lover in World War II. Um, and his story really touched on the writing in a lot of ways of George Chauncey. Um, whose work I've known before, looking at kind of um, identity, you know, gay identity, what you might call gay identity and gay behavior, and the difference between the two um, in the early part of the 20th century, and this his case, J.J. Bellinger's case of the fact um, that he'd been a sort of young soldier, but also then later a member of the Mattachine activist movement, 
seemed very productive and fascinating. But in the end, you have to make choices about what you can fit in an episode, and I couldn't really fit his narrative. Um, you can see him at the start of his life on the right, bottom right, and then as an older man on the left. And um, there's still, I think, a real um, interesting story to be told. You can see him here in the upper left kissing Harry Hay, um, who was one of the pioneers of the Manishing movement, and then the lower left decades before kissing his then boyfriend, Robert Block. And of course, a picture of him as a, num a member of the Royal Canadian Armed, um, Armored Corps um, from, the 19 from 1940. And then finally, one of the kind of favorite things and very touching thing for me to think about um, was to discover a filmmaker and person named Harold O'Neill, Hal O'Neill, and by no means the first filmmaker to focus on his work. Um, a number of people before I made this episode of Pride had looked at his filmmaking and looked at his accomplishments. Um, he was a uh, sort of technical guy and um, very interested in, as an amateur photographer and super eight filmmaker. For decades, he photographed pretty much everything that happened in his life. Um, one of the amazing things you see in his footage is slice of life footage that captures the happy hours and days and weeks and months and years eventually that he spent with George Torgerson, Torg um, was his nickname, and that was um, Hal's lover of many years. They were together for, I think, 40 years or 50 years. Um, and you see in these, this picture here, just a few of the many clips of the day-to-day -day life that's captured. And, you know, this was a kind of central inspiration for thinking about the episode. These, you know, images of the 1950s where people had fun, where queer couples had fun, where they had parties. Um, the title of the episode, by the way, I don't think I've ever acknowledged to him directly, comes from George Chauncey. He says something in his interview, he says the phrase, people had parties and it sort of popped out of the, um, the transcript um, of the final episode as a way to title it, because we all think of the 50s as you know the age of anxiety. We think of the 50s as this miserable time where McCarthy ruined people's lives and spied on people for political purposes um, or, or where activism and political pushback languished. Um, but I don't think that's the whole story. And that was what was exciting to work on this episode was to, is to, um, focus on that bigger history, I'm going to stop sharing because there's no reason to continue to do so because that's my last slide. Um, yeah, and so that was what I think um, came out. In terms of the order, I started with, I found the Lester Hunt case uh, because a book had been written by um, one of the interview subjects in the episode named Roger McDaniel. Um, and that book was so compelling and persuasive and I was so shocked that I myself had not known of this case that had happened so uh, in recent history that a US Senator had shot himself. And, and also that the Senate was so closely tied and how much it seemed like now and how I could think of um, Stiles Bridges as, as a version of Mitch McConnell. Um, those were all ways to enter a decade that was long in the past. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe that's a natural place. And so that's, you know, those were the characters I started with that document. Um, was shared with potential interview subjects and creative collaborators. And um, I sort of worked on two threads at the same time. Unlike the other directors of this series, I was really fortunate to be able to do dramatic material, you know, with, uh, with scripted material with actors. So I was working on drawing on the writing of Madeline Tress, who had left behind a memoir when she died, or, you know, working on the public record of what happened with Lester Hunt to create, you know, uh, short scenarios that were scripted, and at the same time figuring out um, and working with Alex and the team to identify the right interview subjects, travel to the places that needed to do that, um, and then work on shaping the episode. Um, I think it's probably a good time for me to bring in everyone now, um, which is to welcome back Alex and Kendall, and then to welcome for the first time, uh, my colleague from the Department of History, George Chauncey, and friend and interview subject. Hello, it's nice to be with you guys. Um, yeah, and just to open it up, I mean, it was such a, um, for me, I'd never done television before. I didn't know it was possible. Um, I think we accomplished something so political and, um, engage both with the past and the present moment. And all those things were really 
exciting to me to be a part of. Okay, so I'm George Chauncey and uh, we're supposed to ask you folks some questions and have a conversation before we open up to the audience. And I want to begin by saying just how much I liked this episode, series as a whole, but definitely this episode. Um, in large part because I do think you presented a much more complicated image of the queer 1950s than most films I have seen in the past have done. Uh, most films, it seems to me, have trafficked in certain cliches about the 50s, and you've done something really fresh here, and I appreciate that a lot. Um, I Actually, my first question, sort of big question, you've already started talking about, but I'd love to hear both of you talk about this a little bit more, which is to tell us a little more about your goal and your process. Um, when I say goal, I, I'm really wondering what did you hope your, what did you hope the intervention of this film would be in the way people think about the queer past and particularly the 50s? Uh, and then how did you come to that? So as a professional historian and teaches here at Columbia, I have a sense of what we do when we're writing uh, a work of history, you know, how we formulate questions or problems to explore, conduct research, develop an argument. And then when we're writing, we engage with a historiography, which is to say, we enter into, into a conversation with other historians who have written about these subjects before. And then some of us who are trying to reach beyond a purely academic audience, think about how to engage a non-professional audience and to raise issues for them in right ways that are accessible and engaging to them and meaningful to them. And, and so I'm just wondering, how you as filmmakers really approach the request that I imagine in some ways you already said was sort of a dawning request to create a 45 minute film about the 50s. Tom, you know, I know that you're very well read and thoughtful about queer cultural history, but how really did you decide what you wanted to say about the 50s? Another way of putting that is, how did you come up with the argument of the film, and what were the preconceptions people have, you imagine people had about the 50s, or your ignorance about the 50s, that you hope to respond to, and, and how did you develop that? Yeah, I mean, it was exciting to work in television with just such a different context than working in feature film, because everything requires you to respond, you're working basically in relationship, it's a conversation immediately. There isn't a kind of like private moment of crawling off in your cave and working alone, right away you're talking and being accountable. At an earlier stage that probably would have been harder, but at this stage I was ready for that and I found that compelling. So FX made clear very early, they, you know, they said all kinds of things that I was like, I took them seriously. They said, we want character driven stories. We wanna go deep. We don't want to rely on archival footage endlessly. And I was like, okay, cool, great. So, I mean, I worried they would want me just to tell one story, um, but no, you know, and then it was a sort of temptation to figure out how much ground could I cover? How much could you fit in? Um, I definitely wanted to push the envelope in terms of having political content or content that challenged the audience because we were in the middle of the Trump, you know, this is, I first talked to Christine in 2018. This is the beginning of 2019. This is a political opportunity, not just a creative artistic opportunity. Um, I met Alex and very early connected and understood, you know, and also was at a stage I could understand her dilemmas and challenges. So try to help aid that, you know, try to not be a problem, actually, to try to make the, not make the episode better and work. Um, and then also, like, take, the, you know, know a good note when she had it, which she had many. So, like, that I, she, I don't know if we would have ended up with Alia Shawkat if she had not spontaneously said, I still remember the van. You were like, it's her. And I was like, it is her. Oh, my God. What a great idea. So that... Um, that conversation shaped things, made me feel like I didn't have to cover a ton of ground, made me feel like I could choose complicated stories. I, I knew that Alex, like watching her watch at work on other episodes, she was constantly looking for the emotional truth or the character story. 
And that's very related to what scripted narrative filmmaking is about, which I already do. So I didn't actually think that I was like suddenly making another form, really, I guess. You know, I knew that I was making, I thought if anything, I was making an essay film, not a documentary. Like I was gonna work with the, so archival, there, there could be an even experimental feel to what we were doing, or that the way we would photograph the interviews would look to some degree with the way we were shooting the narrative stuff. And there would be confusion about shooting people in profile or straight on in both sections. So in even though I didn't know exactly all my cut points, you could make these aesthetic things connect. And there were, um, like there was a deck showing that idea, basically a visual idea of like, how do we photograph the subjects and what do I do? Um, so, and then, and FX made me never feel hampered. I said to you in an email before this conversation, George, that I was absolutely, I waited for someone to object to the interviews about Madeline and Arthur, both completely happily discussing their sexual experiences as teenagers. You know, Madeline being like, I'm 13 and I go into a lesbian bar with a cigarette in my mouth passing as older. And Arthur talking about being picked up in Times Square by adult men. In the era we're living in, which is so filled with sexual shame and also really valid and complex issues about consent and other things. I expected that to be kind of hot button stuff, but instead, it was always treated in the spirit with which it was offered a kind of, you know, both of them laughed. It was like, there was, they saw the humor in it. Um, and I guess in some ways that was the exciting thing is to see those things be part of the episode and other people apart from myself understand why they were good for storytelling and involving the audience. And um, yeah, I mean, I really honestly had a, incredibly positive experience. There were challenges, definitely, don't get me wrong, when they were like, okay, let's see if the complete opposite sequence, you're like, ah! Um, but yeah, no, most, mostly had a good experience because I think they also had shown a track record in the production of the stuff they've been doing. They were serious about the, con you know, they were dealing with queer content in more than Pride in multiple shows. So we weren't the first show we were dealing with um, them on this issue. Um, I've, I've had a chance to watch at least part of the next episode on the 60s. Uh, and I was struck by what you said about being inspired, in part at least, by the idea of, a, of, a, of an essay film, uh, which is making an argument about uh, the past and about a history that has been hidden from, from us, uh, a history which the episode makes quite clear we have misunderstood as being about nothing except secrecy and shame and repression. I mean, in, in some ways, uh, one of the most fascinating uh, arguments of the episode is that it offers us a genealogy, not just of the figure of the homosexual or the figure of uh, the transsexual, as uh, Christine uh, Jorgensen was then called, but a genealogy of the ways in which the increasing visibility in the 1950s made possible, as George summarizes, by the war and by urbanization, slowly creates the conditions for the emergence of what we have come to call homophobia and transphobia. Mm. Uh, so I was really struck uh, by the ways in which you try to pull out that hidden history. And yet uh, each of the, the stories that you tell, the stories of Lester Hunt Jr., the story of Madeline Tress and the story of Christian Christine Jorgensen could uh, be under stood as themselves uh, perpetuating um, another hidden history. And that is a history of race. Um, some of the interviews bring out quite clearly that one of the things that made Christine Jorgensen such a media figure uh, was first the fact that she embodied the success of American technology and actually being able to engineer 
the sex change. Uh, but the other thing was that she was uh, not at all challenging gender normativity and the ways in which femininity was imagined in the American mind through the image of white womanhood. Uh, and um, a couple of your interviewees bring out the ways, uh, the fact that if we were talking about, if we want to a full history of, of trans life uh, in this period, we have to pay attention to the ways in which um, the whiteness of Christian Jorgensen erases, if you will, uh, this hidden history of black and brown trans figures. So um, I guess the question I wanna ask is, if you had an opportunity to revisit or uh, to extend uh, the episode, uh, to do a second hour, uh, what are some of the stories that you think you might want to tell about the hidden history that brings together queerness and transness and um, blackness or non-whiteness more generally, uh, mm -hmm. and the ways in which um, those histories are um, as much a part of the current moment and the current under and and have shaped the current understanding of 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 the past uh, as a story of people like Christine Jorgensen, uh, Lester Hunt, and Madeline Tress. That's an amazing question, and I want to acknowledge that I'm going to answer part of it, but um, ask Alex to jump in because so much of this is related to the questions she had to navigate thinking about the connection between the episodes and also ways as a collaborator and I don't know, like, I don't look, I don't know, is it too big to say, moral conscience of the show about figuring out sort of like what we were gonna look on and what we weren't gonna look at. Um, because, you know, there was definitely a stage early on for me where as a white filmmaker, white male filmmaker, looking at the subject choices I had made, I had a kind of complete panic about like, it's entirely too white. And Alex, that in terms of who I had assembled as narrative subjects and even, in terms of interview subjects, you know, it might not be immediately apparent that Jules Gill Peterson, who's interviewed um, multiple times in the interview, is a person of color. But nonetheless, my interview subjects, my cast, everybody is substantially um, are white characters. And one, you asked who I might think about. One incredible narrative was a woman named Gladys Bentley, who had been a star of the Harlem Renaissance and was a kind of butch black woman who sang very bawdy, incredible songs and led this incredible life, um, you know, openly queer uh, with various girlfriends. And then in the 50s, when she tried to revive her career, there's an example of her on the um, Groucho Marx show, now in sort of very feminine drag, singing very typical 50s feminine songs, um, both for questions of production, like we could never, show what I would have imagined scripting with her. And that was clear that it was difficult, but also really for questions that were very relevant in the moment we were making the episode of like, who should tell her story? Um, and maybe I wasn't the person who should be telling her story in the context of this episode, or maybe I should have been, I don't know. But like that, there was a very active discussion about with Alex um, and other producers of the, the show about who to pick and how to deal with these subjects. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about, you know, like Kendall, I've known you since the days of ACT UP, of course, and um, I mean, all of us have long histories of thinking about these questions. One thing, like I could, it was so empowering to work with collaborators who could help me to see the idea that in the collection of interview subjects, the fact that four trans women were my interview subjects in the same episode, that that was very unusual in television in the U.S. Um, and that, so thinking about identity in this complex way and also thinking about identity across the episodes. So I guess that's a good place to go to Alex because there really was, and also I was, I didn't see everything, but you know, I saw um, Yancey Ford or Yancey Ford's episode or some of the other, or Cheryl Denier's episode or um, Alex and Anthony's episode of how they looked at those periods or also how they then complicated narratives through looking at race as, um, a major element in the narrative that then changed how I thought. And that's different than a feature because I'm one sixth of the thing, you know, like I'm part of the thing. And also, the, you know, I understood I was the first episode and there was pressure and I'm enough of a drama queen 
to like the challenge of being the first episode. I like I, I pitched the first episode on purpose. I I wanted you know it's so like you you know you you either succeed or fail when you're opening the show. So um, that pressure is fun. But yeah, I'll shut up. And I just I'd love to hear Alex talk a little bit about because there were so many questions about the bigger how these things expand across the bigger show. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the intersectionality of uh, queerness and race is 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 actually one of the biggest themes of the entire series, um, and something that we grow and develop uh, that really culminates um, in a major way um, with the last episode. And um, we, you know, it was important that it was challenging to work with seven different filmmakers. There was a directing duo on one of the episodes um to to you know everyone wants to come to the table to do like their vision um and then i had the <laughs> the job of like how do we grow and arc the entire series not just your episode and i think that um you know more time is always a beautiful thing and and i i i would love for for a pride you know part a, a second season of that uh of that to live and to even backdate you know the the 1950s there's so much that is still like that we did not share um uh in the in the the time that we had but in the 60s that was one of the biggest points of actually you know andrew on directed that episode and he kind of came on later um in the series he was one of the last directors that 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 were that we brought on and when he came to the series, every filmmaker kind of got to do who they wanted to do for the most part. Um, you know, there were like conversations and sometimes we would change the characters. And when Andrew came on, I told him that he had a mandate and he had to make Bayard Rustin work in his episode. <laughs> and there was just no, like, it was just like, this is not, an, this, that was a part of his interview. Like this, you're inheriting Rustin's story. There's no way that we're gonna go through the 1960s and, and not have him there. Um, and it wasn't just about what he did in the 1960s. It was about the connective tissue that he he then he he basically is a godfather of you know of 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 the African American movement. But he's also that becomes the movement that inspires the queer liberation movement, right? So when we get to the March on Washington and Cheryl's episode in 1979, it was really important to understand that we had built that history um, to see how the how you know the the, the queer civil rights movement, there was so much of it that was authored by Black Americans. And that was immensely important, you know, for us to make that point. Um, so, um, you know, and we, we, we put it on the, the, the shoulders of Audre Lorde to discuss what it means, what intersectionality means. And the fact that you can be all, all of these different, you know, you can, you can identify as many different things and, and that makes your whole. And um, there were a, there was a lot of emphasis put on that, um, a lot of baton tossing, you know, I guess if, if you could say. But um, for me personally, I, I was very committed to honoring, um, you know, the the uh, the folks that really blazed that path. And while there were a lot of white folks that that did the work, um, a lot of non-black folks that did the work, um, the movement was was very much so copied from, from what the, 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 the Black Civil Rights Movement um, did in this country. Um, so I don't, as a showrunner, I can't, it's, it's for me, the whole series is the body of work. Um, and uh, and it, it's not to take away or add or subtract to any one episode, but um, I would encourage everyone here, um, if you have not watched the entire series to do so, because there is a there is a very 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 um, large theme that, that that carries throughout a historical theme, um, and with that, you know, the '60s was kind of a little bit of a clapback episode, for for lack of a better term. Uh, it was a clapback episode in a way because it it was it featured you know uh, people like Felicia Flames, you know, who who has since passed um, as a Latin X. Uh, trans woman who was um, very vocal about like, what about us? Cause it, it was about race, but it was also about class, you know, and, and who, 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 who was getting the right to have their history carried on, who was getting the credit, you know, for, for things. And 
we really wanted to rewind the tape because the 60s is, is so rooted in Stonewall and the, the history of Stonewall. And we know that that's also, you know, the, 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 the real truth of that has, has finally, but the floodgates have finally opened there. But there were a lot of women of color, black women, Latinx women, uh, trans women um, that were, that, that, that were fighting, you know, and doing so much on a grassroots level just to survive that made an, an event like Stonewall even, you know, possible that, that then created, you know, the, the March on Washington in 1979 that then goes to like how, how, you know, folks uh, uh, were able to, to come together, you know, for ACT UP and so on and so forth. So maybe a little bit of a long answer, but, but we really worked hard to try to show that genealogy that, that you spoke of. Yes, and, and um, very effectively so. I'm thinking of a passage uh, that is in one of C. Riley Snorton book, Snorton's book, where he talks about um, telling the story of Black trans life in a way that doesn't, um, that rejects a linear trajectory of time, right? And, the, and viewed as a whole, it is true that you know, the first uh, episode anticipates later episodes, and then the later episodes are have to be viewed in a way that refracts the story they tell through the earlier episodes. And then there are these silent arguments that are made, for example, uh, I'm sure, George, you noticed this by the, um, the, the image, uh, and not a word is said in, in your episode, uh, Tom, by the image of the young Roy Cohn sitting next to uh, McCarthy. Uh, and of course, for those, for anyone who's seen Angels in America or the documentaries about Roy Cohn and who know his, uh, his later story, uh, that's a pregnant image, uh, which anticipates the, the story to come uh, in, in really extraordinary ways. Was that a deliberate choice? I mean, there were lots of photographs of, of McCarthy that you could have chosen, uh, but the one where he's sitting uh, um, with Roy Cohn, I think really encapsulates the complexity and the contradictions of the story that the, the series as a whole tells about LGBTQ plus life. Yeah, I mean, that's the added benefit of Roy Cohn, who, who had been so heavily covered in the, like, in exactly the moment we were making the episode. I think it's Matt Turnauer who made the most recent doc. Mm -hmm. You know, so Matt Turnauer just made this Roy Cohn doc. And there's, you know, like, it's the same thing of, um, you know, Raul Pack's I Am Not Your Negro, knowing right away that there was no way I was going to touch James Baldwin because that film had been so riveting and so compelling. So, mm -hmm. like, what could you, what else were you going to look at? I knew that we would show you McCarthy and that, yes, I chose pictures specifically, you know, because he's always this sycophant little lizard you know, sitting next to McCarthy, whispering in the ear. Um, my, the bee under my bonnet, bonnet still really um, is Styles Bridges. You know, there are, there's in New Hampshire, there are highways named after this blackmailing person who caused Lester Hunt to die. Literally, he's still a hero. He died a millionaire. The, the cause of all the money that his widow had is still not spoken for. It was like making the episode made me so annoyed. And we, you know, we went to, it was a kind of sort of complicated process to um, organize and schedule Tammy Baldwin's interview. I had never interviewed a Senator. My request, I mean, it was laughable. I asked for an hour originally. They, I think they laughed at us out loud in the email, um, you know, cause it's very, you have to you have 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, I think we did actually get longer than I thought we would, but, um, and she, you know, she was, she tried to, during the Obama administration, to have that case brought again under consideration and was not successful. Um, and, you know, uh, Buddy Hunt basically died without the satisfaction of that case ever being brought to light. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the sort of a big part of making this thing in terms, apart from being a storyteller, I think also was it because these things seem so heightened during the Trump period. I don't know, Alex, how you feel about it, but looking back, I felt like we were in a kind of trauma state somewhat, how are a siege state? So everything seemed very dialed up um, about the urgency of the moment and yeah, the stakes of everything. Yeah, I wanted to make a couple of comments. First of all, I just want to say to the people who are 
zooming in, please uh, post any questions you may have on the Q&A, because in a few minutes we will turn to those and we'll, um, have a chance to have the panel address those questions. I, I did want to comment on the question of race uh, in this particular episode. Uh, in some ways, the whiteness of this episode, I think, was particularly obvious and striking because it's so unlike the entire rest of the series, which mm -hmm. engages so deeply and, um, and creatively with questions of race and sexuality. And there are just so many African-American and trans uh, women of color, trans characters of color who throughout the so much of the rest of the series. This one um, doesn't have that. And I, I want to just say in a way also that it's important for us to remember that queer history doesn't grow on trees. Um, that in fact, we know a lot less about black queer history in the 1950s than we do by the 60s and 70s. And most of the historiography, there's a lot about the Harlem Renaissance when black drag performers and um, bisexual blues singers and queer writers played such a prominent role. And then again, in the 60s and 70s, when you've got black queer political activists and writers suddenly really emerging on the scene as key players, and it just continues and grows from there. But there is this kind of gap between the 20s and the 60s. Uh, I mean, finally, I'm coming nearly in the end of a book I've been spending half my life on trying to write about the post war period. And, and I'll just say, you know, I, there's a lot now about Harlem and that but it's really hard to do that research. And it is part of the dynamic relationship between filmmakers and historians. Yeah. You're not coming up with this stuff completely on your own. You're doing a lot of reading and you're also, which was partly behind the question I asked you before about your process. What are you reading? What are you thinking about? And then how do you look for the archival footage? How much of the fact that you found this incredible footage of, um, O'Neill's films, like, like, did you go looking for that or you found that and realized you had to make uh, that a central part of the story? I, I mean, actually, maybe that's the question of that kind of the dynamic between, I, I do want to come back to some of the particular beats in the, the film, but a question about the research process, yeah. how much of it was you had a big idea of what you wanted to be able to do, uh, and so you look for footage and interview subjects and so forth that let you do that. And how much it was just casting your net and seeing what you could find and then running with that. It's a great question. It's such an interesting, and, and like, you know, cause again, Alex will have the big picture of this question because she's navigating it through six episodes. Me, there are certain things I knew early. I knew I want to do Lester Hunt. I want to do Buddy Hunt for sure. I knew it absolutely for sure. But how did you know that? because I read the book on Roger McDaniel, I was so shocked I didn't know this case. I mean, how do we not know a Senator shot himself in 1954? How did I not know his son had, like every part of the case was like so red hot and shocking that I had no doubt. I was like 10 pages into the book that I had ordered and I was like, I'm doing this. Then there was like a search. So then, you know, basically what happens in television is that the research department begins early. There is an archival research department. There were multiple people um, who had very interesting personalities, each one very distinct. Um, and one of them, a woman named Rachel, I work with early kind of primarily. And she, so I knew, I was like, I, I need stuff on Lester and Buddy, what exists? And, you know, we try to contact Buddy and write him a letter. And that's how it leads us to Buddy's daughter, Ellen, because Buddy is incapacitated. He's in his late 80s. And Ellen writes back and says, I'm the daughter. I'm taking care of my father. He's not able to give you an interview. And I write back to her saying, I want to talk to you. Will you talk to me? And I, so we have a phone call where I sort of persuade her. She's very reluctant to, to be a subject of the series. Discovering Madeline Tress is more organic. So it's like, you know, there's a research department and they're going to where the known archives, exactly what you're saying, George, is true. Like 
who could afford film in 1954 and a Super 8 camera? White men, gay men who had jobs that were professional. So are there giant archives of women's footage? No, smaller, as you see in the footage. Are there are Black and um, Latino people having giant archives of footage? No, not generally. And that like in the episode, finding even those snapshots and making sure they were from the 50s that show people of color was a process of tracking down those archives. Um, so yeah, the, our, the research department is providing material and they provide, I say, I want a lavender scare government employee who's fired. And there's a movie at the time called The Lavender Scare that precedes us, a doc, which I intentionally do not watch, but I'm nervous about because I don't want to overlap with them. And we find, uh, Rachel finds this recording of Madeline Tress's interview. At that point, it's just a um, printed transcript. No one's ever gotten the audio recording. I read the transcript and I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, can we, how expensive is it? So they pay to digitize that interview, which has crappy sound quality. But then, you know, that's when she, in the episode when, you know, uh, Madeline Tress, when Alia Shawkat pounds on the desk and talks, she's actually lip syncing, um, sprung on the actor the day we shot it, um, lip syncing that actual footage. So that was her as a character. And then finally, Christine Jorgensen was in the deck, the document that they had put together, the killer films in Refinery 29. And to me, that seemed wildly obvious, like to do Jorgensen, but also what um, Kendall's question embeds was like her blazing whiteness that she had to be white and blonde and what that was. And I knew enough about trans history that by no means was she the first. Um, that seemed a way to kind of look at things in an interesting angle. And then from that, I, I knew, I didn't know everybody that I interviewed in the list of those people. Like I knew Justin Vivian Bond, but I didn't know Susan Stryker and I didn't know um, Jules Gill Peterson. So Tom, how different is the process that you've described in making this documentary film uh, from the process that informs your narrative filmmaking practice? Because, you know, you have made films about actual historical figures. Swoon comes to mind, uh, but uh, Savage Grace as well. So is, was that a different experience for you than the experience of working on the documentary or, or similar? It was different, but I was surprised how related it was. I loved it. I really wet my appetite to work in this form more. Mm -hmm. Because it really raised questions about sort of what is actually the truth of things. And like in the Madeline Tress section, there was so much, in a documentary, you have so much talking. There's so much speech. You want to die. No one ever shuts up. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what I realized in Madeline Tress is like, she just has to not speak and walk endlessly through hallways. Because the feeling of walking endlessly through hallways is what she dealt with in her job and that kind of thinking about like focusing on behavior as a way to show the psychology of the character instead mm -hmm. of speech is very much from narrative filmmaking. Um, but what I found interesting is that like, I, you know, I don't know, my, all my, I felt like all my conversations with Alex were about character and story and narrative and, and emotion and sequence and like understand that weird, there was a whole funny conversation with the network about chronology in the 50s, which I just found very puzzling, where they were like, things are happening out of order. And I'm like, yes, because I'm cutting on theme and emotion. So we like made a cut where we tried to look chron chronologically and it was just crazy. The cut did not make any sense. And it was so reassuring to be, have a close collaborator who, who understood and could, because you know, sometimes the director, you, the door has to close on you and someone has to argue the case in your absence. And I knew that Alex understood the emotional logic of things because, you know, and, and, and that I think the testimony to her work and her, all the producers who worked on the show in that level is the way the six episodes argue bigger case and move between, you know, like it should be completely schizophrenically, you know, put together, but it's not. Somehow there's a thread that runs through the series, so. I think that was quite powerful in the film is this sense of emotional time and of emotional history, not just the, uh, the moments in the hallway, but also the reenactments that took place in the elevator with uh, 
young uh, Hunt and, and the father. Um, there were no reenactments of Christine Jorgensen, but in my imagination, there were reenactments because I remember quite vividly uh, as a young kid going to the drive-in movie in Oroville, California, where I grew up in the Northern uh, Sacramento Valley. Uh, it had to have been in probably in the summer and seeing on a drive-in movie screen, the story of Christine Jorgensen. It's part of my, my queer childhood. Um, and you know, in, 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 the, in the way that you know, so many of our, our queer theorists have talked about how film and, and, and the, the moments of identification uh, that happen when you're watching film as a young queer kid growing up, um, I, I, I couldn't help but think as I watched the archival film of my own experience of the emotional time uh, uh, when I identified with Christine Jorgensen. I think Christine Jorgensen uh, is actually in that film. It's a biopic in which Christine Jorgensen uh, stars, if, I'm, if, if I remember rightly. Uh, but watching the documentary connected the narrative film with my own uh, personal story in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain uh, has to have been true for many other people who watch uh, both your episode and certainly uh, the other episodes in the series uh, that you and Alex have been talking about. Well, Alex's mom shared an amazing memory of Christine Jorgensen and like it just was proof of how personal and, you know, because there was a kind of brushing up against a star and also a sort of relatability about how she had become a star, um, which seems very modern. It's like something we didn't focus on, but like in this idea of, you know, because she wasn't born, she she wasn't, you know, born to be an actor, tried to be an actor. It was like the um, journey of her life. The other thing I think is funny, and it was one of the like, everyone tiptoed around me because I was such a crazy person about it, but in the context that we're talking about, the notion of the so-called recreation in a documentary, generally what that means is an in incredibly badly done thing with non-actors shot with the back of their head. And, you know, I hate to be a queen, but it's me, darling. I'm not gonna do something awful like that. So, you know, the idea of like, of course I was gonna get the best actors to play these roles. And of course I thought of them as just another piece of storytelling. Um, the idea, I'm not recreating anything. I'm, in other words, like the thing, what's happening with Madeline Tresses. So the idea, you know, we, there was this idea, was it a recreation or a reenactment? Not really. I'm imagining actually from whole cloth, this, this book that Madeline Tress wrote about her life and trying to figure out what that looked like. I shared a bit of that um, with George and like the writing, the overall book is actually not fantastic, but her voice is amazing. You know, like I'm quoting her directly. I'm not, that's her, not me. And she's funny and wise acreish. So I knew enough as a narrative writer that you don't need a lot of plot. You just need character. I need, you need a voice the audience can relate to and connect to um, and that she's emotional. And just the primal thing of like getting fired from your job, we all can relate. Um, so you don't need a ton. Like that was like, you don't need a ton. With, with um, Lester Hunt, it's, you know, somebody bringing a gun into a government office and shooting themselves is such a loaded thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like each section had different, and if we had had our way, we would have done dramatic stuff with Jorgensen, but it was just a question of juggling the resources. And, um, and also I was getting away with doing stuff that was scripted in part because many of the subjects were dead. So the idea that I could make a satisfying documentary and that was, partially strategic about the way I pitched and thought of it. I knew that that would be one of the challenges, but I wanted to see if you could bring scripted stuff in and not have it feel yeah, fake or dumb. Yeah, and, and I wanted to comment that, Kendall, your memory and some materials I've come across in my research just reminds us that how few public figures there were at that point. So I think you do a really good job using Jules and Susan's commentary to really highlight the way her whiteness made it possible for her to get the attention that she did, as well as the fact that she was just an incredibly shrewd player of the media and the way she staged her return and getting off the boat and the, you know, the press gathered around and the 
the interviews she gave and selling her life story and the doing her nightclub act. I mean, she worked it. And so there are all sorts of reasons that we remember her, but there were so few figures like that that were visible that you can remember seeing her film, uh, her show, a film about her life and a drive-in. I've come across letters from the 50s where someone is writing to a journalist trying to explain queer life in the early 50s and says, I'm a Christine Jorgensen type. You know, didn't even have the word transsexual to use, let alone transgender, not yet invented, but I'm a Christine Jorgensen type. It just, uh, the power of these, um, these handful of characters who, who came to the fore in this way. Um, I want to go back to, to the Lester Hunt story. Um, you mentioned earlier, Tom, that J.J. Ballinger raised for you questions the relationship between uh, what we'd call homosexual behavior, maybe, same-sex behavior and identity. Um, I think Moore, the person who raises that issue for me most emphatically in the segment is Lester Hunt Jr., uh, who is arrested trying to pick someone up in a Lafayette Park across the street from the White House, well known amongst gay men at the time as a cruising area and also well known to the Washington police. So lots of people arrested there, lots of careers were destroyed there. But someone who then goes on and gets married to a woman and has kids. And so really brings to the full forefront those questions of who is he? What, how do we understand his trajectory? Um, and I was actually surprised you didn't explore that a little bit more. I mean, you had some, a wonderful moment with the daughter where she reflects, you know, I heard my grandfather, of course I knew my grandfather was dead, maybe the other grandfather was alive. Then I was told he committed suicide. Then I was told it had something to do with my father. Then eventually I was told it had some why, what my father had done. That, like the Jorgensen story, reminds us about the kind of um, the silence that surrounded this. No one had told her earlier on. She's living in an era when she can't Google her father. Um, she's not going to, it got a lot of attention at the time before she was born, but she's not going to find these newspaper stories. And, and there was, like, by common consent, no one was going to tell her the story, even though it is certainly the, the case that every adult in her life when she was a child would have known this story. And so partly they're just the levels of secrecy and circulation of knowledge here that are really interesting to reflect on in that story. But also the question of her father. What, how do we understand his story? And I'm, I wonder if you had thought more about trying to explore that, use that to think about identity in this period and the policing of identity? Totally. I don't want to answer too long because I'm keep yakking and yakking and every answer I give, there's a corollary answer Alex can give. And in this instance, I actually want her to talk about the early cut of the interview of Ellen and what changed. Um, so just to say, all these questions I thought about a ton, there's the human aspect of like, you're a person whose father had this happen and your grandfather killed himself. So, and I had never done a doc and I'd made narrative films where you dealt with real people about the life rights or the questions of what you were depicting, but I had never dealt with somebody that talked that way and I was gonna have them on camera. So that was a new thing. Um, so when I was gonna ask or how I was gonna ask, we talked before the interview in a way that made it clear to me that Ellen had pondered these questions about behavior versus identity. And in the interview, I actually got her to give what I thought, and that's why I want Alex to talk. I thought I had gotten like a zinger or a cliffhanger and it was a kind of naive reaction. She literally said, are you asking my father's gay? And then she pauses very dramatically and answers. And my first cut used it as a cliffhanger, like a commercial break cliffhanger. And the producers were like, no, we're not making that. And it was so helpful to realize like, oh, right, we're not making that. Like in other words, it was exploitive the way I was cutting it. Um, and the unanswerable aspect of the question in the way Ellen answered it. In other words, that it was like, because it wasn't simply answerable, 
was persuasive, I guess. Um, and then I also tried to go back and read the interview. I interviewed a person named um, Rick Ewig, who is a historian who interviewed Buddy very early. I don't, it's when I recreate Buddy speaking in the elevator, like the actors reading those lines, those are transcribed from Rick's interview actually. So it's like Buddy talking about what he remembered, but very close. The interviews done closer to the real event are usually more trustworthy. Anyways, no, I, I'll stop there. I'm just, I'm curious for, because it's like having a sense of what the whole series was and I didn't know what I was doing. And you like, I'm shameless showman. I'm like, oh, well, that's exciting piece of drama. And then you realize like, that doesn't fit in the episode. Um, yeah, anyways. Alex, I don't know, would you comment on? Alex, do you want to say more? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that, you know, with a lot, of, a, a lot of this, I think you have to, I encourage everyone who's listening to understand that, you know, documentaries are, um, are films too. You know, we have real, real run times. We have network <laughs> like expectations. Uh, I'm sure if it was up to Tom Kalen, he would just go off and have endless resources to shoot and shoot and shoot and turn in a 10 hour documentary about the 1950s that would totally encapsulate like everything, you know, that he possibly could. And he would work on it for 15 years and hire all sorts of, you know, resources and people to, to get into the nitty gritty of it. But, you know, making, making television and making documentary docu series, which is really like our, in, in our culture, it's docu television. Um, there's, there's doing what you can with the resources that you have. And um, I think that that's just a very practical thing to, to maybe just point out because we can all look at things and, 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 and see like what wasn't discussed or why would, didn't this happen? And, and I think that that's all very valuable. I think it's valuable because then it becomes a challenge for another filmmaker to go out there and go grab that and go do that and continue this story. You know, you, you go make that. Um, Pride was a lot, was a start. Pride is not the history. Pride is not the full textbook. Pride is not the full experience. Pride is just, is just, is just a, a group of us that were trying to get a conversation started in Trump's America um, while we were all living, that while we all entered into, you know, the world that changed in 2020. And I, I think that, you know, making docs, it's a Herculean task. You don't have a script. You don't have the, the, the privilege and the luxury to even know what you're gonna get until you are shooting. And then you have to go turn that into a story. And Tom, using the example of, of Buddy Hunt's daughter, you know, you don't, you have to, we're all human beings and, and, and who are we to assume someone's identity, their sexual identity. Um, and if you only have one human being that's alive to tell the story, you're into that character is very much um, handcuffed to what you're getting, you know, from, from the, the family member who survived to, to tell the story. And I think that that kind of should, um, I think that you could have a macro, like it, it represents a, a more macro situation with, with making this series, which is like, how do we preserve our, how do we preserve our culture? How do we, how do we, how do we document it? And how do we create an America where you don't have pockets and blackouts of history because of someone's identity, because someone is black or because someone was too poor or because you know, someone was a woman. Um, and and, and my, it, because I've been doing docs for 20 years, it's very common to, um, to get on a project and you, have to, you, you wanna tell the story, but you have to figure out how to tell it with the resources that you have. And, and, and use your imagination to like figure out like, oh, okay, I have no, I have no archival. Well, what is the viewer gonna watch? Um, I can make narrative vignettes. Tom doesn't use the word recreations, he uses the word narrative vignettes. And we all learned that, uh, every single person on the staff. So I think that, um, that uh, I think what you're watching is, 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 it's not even just, it's not even the beginning. There's, there's queer film that predates this, but I think that it was an opportunity to, to, to bring a community of people together to do the best that we could with the resources that we had. You know, docs are, we don't have the budgets of, of, uh, of uh, you know, the big HB, like Game of Thrones. Like that's not the reality that we're in. We, 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 use, we, use, we use the community and, and, and I say community and I don't even mean that lightly because it's the community um, on the, that was interviewed 
Um, it's the community of people like Susan Stryker, who was like, we talk about Christine Jorgensen and her whiteness and how she had a camera and all that kind of stuff. Totally. She was very privileged to be able to, to document her own history and to put her to, to save her image. But Susan Stryker was like, I have a bunch of her stuff and I'm not going to charge you a thousand trillion dollars to use it. I care. I, I, I'm going to give you, she gave Tom her footage that she had amassed to be able, so that we could put it in our film because everybody making this film was like, how do we preserve the cultures? We would share interviews with people. Um, you know, we would, we shared flawless, you know, Sabrina, we had filmmakers that, that shared flawless Sabrina's story with Cayenne, you know, her, her daughter, um, so that her daughter could hear her mother talking about, I mean, there was a lot going on, you know, behind the scenes. And, and I just, I, I, I just, I implore, everyone here who 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 to be inspired to go make more go find more go be the person you know especially in the, in the in the i'm not a scholar i'm not from the world of academia but documentary documentarians rely on the work that comes out of uh the, the world of academia sometimes to to find to go and hunt for for characters and and for the 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 unseen people of of america and the untold stories so I, i'll get off my soapbox but i just want to make that point yeah, and you know, I, so we need to move to the questions from the audience. Um, but I do want to say that part of what I love about the series is that it is so idiosyncratic in a way. It 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 comes. It feels like it comes from the passions of this incredibly diverse, incredibly talented group you have of, of filmmakers working with some people like yourself, Alex, to try to give it some kind of coherence as a whole, but it's it's not trying to be a textbook. You know, we don't have the Mattachine in the 50s. Well, we've had a lot of other films that have talked about Mattachine in the 50s. You are giving us a really different way into thinking about everyday queer life in the 50s that a film about the Mattachine Society isn't gonna give us. Or to have Cheryl Dunier start with Barbara Hammer and Audrey Lord because they were so important to her and then to talk more about the marches and so forth, which is just beautiful. I mean, that was is a great way to into this. And I, I salute you for that. Um, Let me just say, uh, uh, where George says idiosyncratic, I would say queer, right? So this is, <laughs> this is a, a series that's telling a story about queer history broadly, but it's also informed by a queer aesthetic. Um, and I would say a queer ethics of filmmaking uh, which you put your finger on, Alex, when you talked about the ways in which the story of the production of this film is a story of community uh, and community building, uh, and that the film, now Tom directed the film, and his name is affixed to the film as director, but the story you told is very much a story about the ways in which um, it takes a village uh, to, to make a documentary. And I really appreciate that insight uh, because it, it, um, it emphasizes the specificity uh, and the possibilities for queer documentary uh, filmmaking practice at this moment uh, in ways that are important uh, and certainly urgent for all the many reasons uh, that you've just outlined. Back to you, uh, George. Yeah, and I, yes, you've, it's, um... It's a model of queer extended kinship networks pulling this together in a really beautiful, beautiful way. All right, I wanted, do want to ask you to talk about a few questions we've been asked. Um, someone is uh, says they're fascinated by the friendship between Lorraine Hansbury and James Baldwin. And let me go back and say that even though I talked about the sort of relative dearth of material we have on Black gay life in the 50s, clearly we do have some key writers and activists in my lecture course in LGBT history. They read Audre Lorde's memoir about the 50s. They read Baldwin on the 50s. They hear about Pauli Murray. There are a few other people like that. So there, there's some well-known figures whose memoirs and biographical materials we have I was really thinking about the everyday life of people who didn't write a play or weren't a major legal brief or whatever. Yeah. So, but this is speaking to a really interesting question about Lorraine Hansberry, the playwright, and James Baldwin, who were friends. 
Uh, and this person, Thomas, teaches, um, asks their students to imagine a Saturday night where they would meet up and consider where they meet and what they would talk about. And I wonder if you have any insights into their lives and friendship in the 50s in New York and access that did or not did not have in New York society. I wish I myself knew more. I mean, I know a bit about Baldwin's biography and I knew that they were friends, but I don't know the texture and detail of that friendship. And that's an amazing thing to imagine um, as a, you know, I mean, either like my immediate reaction to that is wanting to see those scenes fictionalized and dramatized um, because I know probably there's no documentary footage that shows it. Um, yeah, and I mean, in terms of specifically considering that narrative, we didn't actually, but it, 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 and I think it's partially what Alex is pointing to is the working on impulse and what the research process makes available to you in the time frame that you have. So there's literally like a week when you're like, okay, we have to lock and decide what the characters are and what we're doing. Um, and I, I joined her with the invitation of like, that's an amazing subject. I'd love to see another series. Like I'd love to see um, Hansberry and Baldwin's relationship um, dramatized and shown and explored. I agree, that would be fantastic. A good next film, Tom, <laughs> or Alex. <laughs> Um, someone else asked if you were familiar with Lucy Hicks, an African-American trans woman who married a sailor and went to jail for it. Um, she was from the late 40s, got out of prison in the 50s. I'm actually, I know that that's Brian Belovich, and I just want to say hi to Brian Belovich, who wrote an amazing memoir of Brian Belovich's life. Um, so I grew, I just, in terms of giving a shout out to our audience, and if you've never read um, The Incredible Life um, of Brian Belovich, read that book. I don't know, Brian, I didn't know Lucy Hicks. And it's one of those things of like, we are, you're literally, I don't know, the feeling in the beginning of, and again, I hope I have other opportunities to explore that, figuring out what the content is. But, you know, it was very quick. I don't know, eight weeks, 12 weeks max. By 12 weeks, we were deciding for sure what we were doing. And um, I wish I started from the, that kind of really wide place of looking. I want, like I'm, I wrote down Lucy Hicks's name on a piece, the piece of paper in front of me, and I'm gonna do some looking into it after this Zoom panel, because I'm intrigued. Um, and sort of curious, mostly relied on in terrible sense of like what libraries, Google and other things of public record. And there's some ways that what has already been written about gets amplified because it's already been written about. And that's why the, this, this process of making, bringing more light to these stories is so important. There's a very practical question um, about how, if at all, um, one can purchase this series will it be available for purchase can you purchase it i you can right now if you have a, a subscription on hulu you can watch the entire um the entire series um i don't believe it's something that is for purchase um I, I i'm not sure um effects is a part of the disney universe and they're all everything is just merging into one company um mm -hmm. but i do know that you can watch the entire thing on hulu there's definitely a market for that kind of thing library wise, but you know, now well, they don't see it that way now. You know? Yeah. And I think that, you know, people are responding to something that's actually happening in real time with, with makers. Um, I actually just had a call today about it um, uh, with another project. And there's a real big push to figure out how docs, especially right now, because there's, there's so much documentary content being made. And there is finally, there are finally people, um, you know, uh, like me, I'm a, a black female showrunner. I, you know, I haven't, I've been working for 20 years and I just have been kind of able to be, to be in a position like that. Um, and I think because you're getting so many different voices of, of, of makers, um, the community is changing. And one huge thing that's happening, you know, in the documentary community is a push to figure out how do we get our films um, beyond the streaming services, you know, how do we get our films, how do we get our films in schools, you know, when we talk about critical race theory and, and things like this and, and the doc, the doc community, we, we, for many of us, it's, it's very imperative that um, we know that we're blessed and fortunate to be able to capture stories and often because it's a business, though, and we don't 
own, you know, Tom and I don't own pride <laughs> so, because it's a business. You kind of, you deliver your show and then it comes on, you know, Hulu effects, whatever. And you hope that people watch it. But I think that we're now getting into this, this part of America, of culture, of, of content making where it needs, we need to do more than that. And um, that's a conversation that we have been having with effects, especially specifically about pride. How can, how can it be used um, uh, uh, and viewed? You know, a lot of people can't even afford these types of uh, uh, subscription services. Um, and I know it's a really big thing uh, with, with the collective of black uh, documentarians that, that we are working on. So I just wanna say that sometimes things feel awkward and weird because it's like there's change happening in real time. And I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. That was really helpful, really illuminating. Um, think both about the possibilities of this moment and the constraints, um, since indeed many people can't afford these streaming services. Very few can afford many of them at once. Um, and I, I, it's fascinating to hear your account of how the, sort of the business model of documentary making is changing. Just one more beat on that. It does feel like this is a kind of golden age of documentaries, that there are a lot being made. And what is driving that, do you think? How much of that is the business model? There's just a lot of streaming services out there that need content. And how much of it is about some moment in the social media era and, and sort of ungrounded moment when people are, want documentaries, want some kind of connection to the world and just history in this way? or whatever thoughts you may have about why uh, so many documentaries are being made now. I, I think it's, 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 there's a lot of reasons for it. Obviously streamers, there's, there's a lot of room, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of places that you can go and do that. And I think that, you know, documentaries are proving to be a place where people can tune in and, and, and immediately be exposed to things that they had no idea about or be immersed in that culture or be of that culture and finally see themselves, you know, in, in, in the world that they come from on a screen. And um, I, um, I, I think that there's, it, it's moving at a very fast speed and there's a lot of activity happening because, you know, the doc world was so tiny um, and, and very small. And we were always kind of the step, the redheaded stepchild, no offense to redheads, uh, the stepchild <laughs> to the scripted world, you know, to the big, you know, the big, the big features. And um, it's really interesting to see a lot more scripted directors, you know, like Tom come and, and, and work on um, in the doc space. Um, I, I just, I think that many of us are very, uh, we are caution, ca cautiously optimistic about the future of it because, you know, things, things, capitalism is real and things turn into a business and, and we, the culture, you know, many, like I said before, many of us are trying to protect and um, remember, you know, the power of what documentaries can actually do. And I think pride is a perfect example um, of that. Um, and it also, you know, it's, it's flawed in some ways because it, it also shows you some of the reality of what, of, of what happens when you're, working in business, you know, with, doc with documentaries. We don't live in the world where documentary filmmakers can take 15 years to make that perfect film that, you know, like Hoop Dreams or, or you know, not that that's, I'm not saying that that's a perfect film, but just take all the time in the world to follow people. Those are, that's a minority of, of, of what's happening right now. We're in the machine of television and docu-series are, are made typically under one year. And that's why it's a very Herculean task to pull off um, because it's not easy. Um, to get people to come to the table, uh, to be willing participants. You know, you might want to tell the story of uh, person X, but you have no one to tell that. You have no one that you can talk to that can tell their story. You can read about it and write about it, but transforming it into a doc is a very is a very different process. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, one last question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, Tom, this is a question for you, um, and I'll condense it a little bit. What was the moment that you unexpectedly just felt a thrill of pleasure, discovery in this particular moment? And what was the moment when you felt a restriction that was frustrating to you in the process of making this? I assume there were many of both of those moments. Totally. 
Totally. I mean, I want to thank my darling friend, Tina, who's asking that question, who herself is like a brilliant Sundance jury award winning prize documentarian. So she knows a, two, a thing or two about documentaries. Um, the surprising part for me was um, when you do interviews, they come back from production, you have a transcript. Many documentarians redo a paper cut of that transcript. <coughs> Excuse me. Meaning they use that documentary transcript as a way to shape the edit. I couldn't really read the interviews at first. I had to watch the interviews be performed, actually. And I like looked at them as I looked, would look at dailies. I was now looking to see like not the information they imparted, but when is the speaker have emotion? So I actually treated the dailies kind of the way I would do the interviews, the way I might treat dramatic dailies. Like, where's the heat? Where's the emotion? Where's the embarrassment? Where's the excitement? Um, only very late did I understand how to use the transcripts. So like, that's how I first made selects and that's what we leaned into in the cut. And then eventually when Alex would be like, you need to connect whatever thematic thing with that other thing you I could I could search those documents to find the word that would be repeated in more than one interview and start to then find thematic connections so that surprised me and empowered me and I and the idea that like there was performance in documentary that was really a big revelation and also like I understood that while I was on camera interviewing somebody and had eye contact with somebody and the camera was rolling that I was actually involved in that performance like if I leaned in, if I leaned back, if I looked away, if I paused, all those things had impact on the subject. And it was thrilling because my background was as an actor. I know a lot about performance. So I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. I'm like the scene partner, but they can't see me. Okay, so that was fun. The frustrating part was like the network asking to see the thing in another sequence and me knowing for sure they were wrong and thinking like, okay, five days. Here we go. Um, and also sort of like not wanting to be a grown up and not have a um, fit. I'll leave us with the great wisdom of Janixa Bravo, who you might know from directing the movie called Zola and um, also her first feature is called Lemon. She came, I teach a class at Columbia University called First Features. She came to that class and talked about working in television. And she said that working in television is all about mourn and pivot, mourn, and pivot. Like you get the bad news, you, you cry for five seconds, you wipe your snot on your sleeve and you make the change. Um, so yeah, that was the frustrating part is like having those notes. And, but what was so rewarding is making all the changes, going to the network and saying like, you guys, this isn't the right thing. And them saying, actually, you're right. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's maybe a good note. I felt a lot of respect for them. It was a, it was a victory. Um, sometimes even the bad things end up good. Okay. Great, this has been wonderful. That's, a, uh, I think, a, a wonderful note on which uh, to end. We'd like to extend our thanks to the Columbia University School of Arts for providing this platform for such a rich and um, lively discussion. Uh, thank you to Tom, thank you to Alex, thank you to George, um, thank you to me. Um, <laughs> and go see Kendall Thomas at, pub, at the Public Theater, where he'll be performing soon brilliantly. Uh, thank you, Tom. That's very sweet. Um, and thank you to our, our unseen audience. Uh, we look forward to an opportunity uh, very soon to gather in a room um, and uh, to gaze upon one another and to view film together. Um, um, that will be a wonderful communal experience. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, George. Yeah, and I just also want to send a shout out to Gavin Browning, who really pulled this whole thing together, and the rest of the staff at Lundfest really did a fantastic job. Thank you for making this happen. Indeed. Uh, Tom, I do want to say you're really a great interviewer. Having been interviewed by you for this film, I've been interviewed by a lot of documentary makers, and you're really in that top rank. It was just oh. fantastic to work with you on this. But what just fun. to echo what Kendall just said, thank you also to the audience, everyone who came. And we look forward to being in a room in Lundfest with you sometime soon. Okay, take care, everybody. Can't Good wait. night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>